This week on Adventist News Network, heart surgery for underserved patients in Fiji. Humanitarian relief in Guatemala. And a new book reflects on the Chilean mining disaster one year later. These stories and more coming up. This is Adventist News Network, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. I'm Mark Kellner. And I'm Fernita Buddy. Thank you for joining us this week. First in the news, Sydney Adventist Hospital in Australia will provide free heart surgeries for up to 60 underserved patients in Fiji this week. The hospital's Operation Open Heart Project has provided free cardiac surgeries for more than 600 people in Fiji during 20 trips to the South Pacific Island. More than 60 cardiac specialists and other medical staff volunteer their time and skills to perform these surgeries. Since the project was launched, Operation Open Heart volunteers have performed some 3,000 surgeries in 13 countries. In addition to open heart surgery, expert physicians perform other surgeries, ranging from cleft palate repair to eye surgery. Sydney Adventist Hospital is one of Australia's leading providers of cardiac care. An Adventist hospital chaplain in Berlin was awarded recently for offering distressed pregnant women a safe anonymous alternative to abandoning their babies. Waldfriede Adventist Hospital Chaplain Gabriel Stangl received Germany's Medal of Merit for operating what hospital staff call the cradle. The project allows women to leave their babies in a cradle behind the hospital clinic. Sensors trigger a delay alarm so the mother has time to leave before the staff is alerted. The baby is immediately placed under medical care in the hospital's nursery. If the mother doesn't reclaim her child within eight weeks, the baby is put up for adoption. Stangl says mothers have left 20 newborns in the cradle over the past decade, and more than 100 women have given birth anonymously at Valfride. Stangl says 95% of these women find the courage to identify themselves after undergoing therapy. While she says two-thirds still give up their babies for adoption, many women decide they want to give their baby the chance to connect with its mother in later life. Stangl previously earned the Association of Adventist Women's Women of the Year Award. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Guatemala is partnering with a national television station in the country to collect and distribute relief supplies in the aftermath of several natural disasters. Thousands of Guatemalans were recently affected when their country was struck by earthquakes, tropical storms, and damaging rains. Young volunteers from dozens of churches in Guatemala City worked 14-hour days for more than a week to assemble and distribute food packages to shelters in affected communities. ADRA has also distributed water, hygiene kits, and other emergency supplies. Adventist leaders in the country are reporting that hundreds of Adventists lost their homes and farms. For Adventists in Australia, small donations are adding up to a lot of good. Alumni, staff members, and friends of Adventist-run Avondale College in Australia have collected $100,000 for mission by each donating at least 1% of their income for two years. The 1% Club pools these donations towards projects in developing countries. Previous projects have built schools, fed orphans, and paid teachers in Cambodia, India, and Nepal. For several suspenseful hours on October 13, 2010, the attention of the entire world was centered on a solitary spot in the Chilean desert. It was there the 33 trap miners emerged to fresh air and freedom and the eager embrace of jubilant family and friends after having spent 10 weeks entombed one half mile underground. Their emergence brought an end to the greatest mine rescue of all time. This week, the book Hope Underground was launched. The story, as told to writers Mario Veloso and Jeanette Wendell, records the personal journey and spiritual involvement of a local unassuming minister with the miners and their families in a series of circumstances that would change his life forever. Seventh-day Adventist pastor Carlos Para Diaz rose to prominence by becoming the influential chaplain of Camp Hope, a makeshift tent community established not far from the site of the mine collapse. We were able to speak with Marcos Cruz, the publisher of Hope Underground. Marcos? How did you get involved with this project? 
As a Christian publisher, I am constantly looking for inspiring stories. When I heard that the miners were discovered alive, and there was an Adventist pastor sending them 33 small bios, Pastor Para, I said, wow, that could be an excellent book. So I contacted Pastor Para, and the next day I flew to Chile to sign a contract with him to publish his story. The title of the book is Hope Underground, the 34 Chilean Miners, a story of faith and miracles. The media reported that there were 33 miners. Why is the number 34 mentioned in the title of your book? After Pastor Parra sent out the 33 small Bibles, some of the miners started sending him letters to thank him for his pastoral care. In one of these letters, Jimmy Sanchez, the youngest of the miners, said, there are actually 34 of us down here, because God has never left us alone. What drove these miners to defy failure and persevere against all odds? The successful rescue of the 33 miners was a deeply spiritual experience. When the miners realized that only a miracle could save them, they started to pray and repeat Bible texts that they knew by heart. We believe, without a doubt, that their faith in God gave them the courage to survive until they were rescued. For more information, visit afbookstore.com. Thank you, Marcos. To find out more about this project, visit www.hopeunderground.com. Coming up, a preview of this week's Adventist Review. Welcome back. Here's Jean-Luc Luzot with a preview of this week's issue of Adventist Review. This is a very special week in the United States of America. It is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving takes precedent of all other things and all other holidays. It is first of all a special time for family reunion. But in all these festivities which are mainly sharing plenty of good food, we often forget how truly blessed we are in the first world. Do we realize that 22,000 children under five years old are dying every day of poverty-related diseases? This is our cover story. We are supposed to be steward of God's bounty. In fact, if I recall correctly, it was one of the first stewardship assignments that God gave to Adam. He told him all the fruits of the land and the trees were for him to use. Fortunately, since men received the gift, he used this in the most selfish way there is. On planet Earth, there is enough to eat for everyone. The sad truth is that billions are living under extreme poverty with less than one dollar a day. When we will be about to taste our turkey and everything that goes with it, let us remember the less fortunate. Let us find ways to share of God's blessing. Our good friend and colleague, Lael, Caesar wrote the devotional. He explained that the better we understand giving, the better thanksgiving will be. In kids' view, an interesting news tells us how students in one of our schools collected money to send to an orphanage in Haiti. And what difference did it make? Thanksgiving, stewardship, it is about sharing God's blessing around us. Don't miss this issue. Adventist mission videographer Dan Weber visited the southern United States in the aftermath of devastating tornadoes early in 2011. 
This is how Adventist Mission is involved. In April of 2011, the southern part of the United States was ravaged by a series of tornadoes. The worst damage was done in the state of Alabama. And I wanted to take a look at well, how did the Adventist church respond to this? What did Adventist members do? What did churches do? What did the organized church as a whole do to respond to this horrible disaster? Hundreds of homes were destroyed, lives were lost. And so I decided to go to Birmingham, Alabama and take a look and see what happened there. Uh, on a church basis, several of the churches in the community there directly responded right away. They went out, they helped clean up, they gathered supplies. Adventist Community Services is an organized church on the whole, uh, organized a warehouse, and they became the distribution point for all of the resources that were brought into the Birmingham area from all these different aid organizations. It was really something special to see. And then church members themselves, even though they, some of them had their houses destroyed, they were out the next day helping in the local community. Go to our website, AdventistMission.org, and look for the video on the tornado. Now let's hear from Megan Bronner. She has this week's Adventist social media highlights. In honor of Thanksgiving, we've asked our social media followers to tell us what blessings they are experiencing. Our ANN Facebook friends said their top blessings were learning the truth about God and understanding His forgiveness. On Twitter, Ray Dabrowski says he is thankful for our right to free expression. Walter Mello told us he's grateful for the chance to use his work in the media to fulfill the mission of the church. Bren Pro feels blessed by the transformation in his life and the lives of his family members. And Washington Conference remembered the eight-year anniversary of the Auburn Academy Girls' Storm Fire. They said they are still thankful for God's blessing of protection. We also took a Facebook poll this week asking you about your favorite part of the winter holidays. The majority of you said visiting family was the top priority, with rest and relaxation taking second place. And while one holiday is barely over, we're already talking about the next. We want to know how you plan to share the gift of Jesus' birth in your community. Reply to Adventist News on Twitter with the hashtag JesusBirthday, or leave a comment on our Facebook page. Look for your responses on our Christmas edition of ANN. Dwayne Leslie says recent laws in Europe are setting a dangerous precedent. We asked him to explain. Here in the United States, we're fortunate to enjoy significant levels of religious freedom. However, we are noticing a disturbing trend is there is an increase in anti-religion laws being enacted in Europe. Here in the International Religious Liberty Association, we're tracking these trends specifically against religious minorities because we're seeing a distinguishing factor between older and established religions and ones that are newer or have fewer members or deemed foreign. We think this sets a dangerous precedent. Recently, Congressman Heath Schuler and Trent Franks sent a letter to uh, the French Prime Minister expressing their concern about anti-religion laws in France and the treatment of religious minorities there. We're also seeing examples, as we've seen in Hungary, where uh, all but 14 of the largest, more established religions were recently deregistered. Unfortunately, the Adventist Church was included in that group, and again, the older religions were the ones that were protected. Again, these are just two examples of anti-religion sentiment that's going on throughout the world and why we have to be very uh, strong advocates for religious freedom and protecting the rights to worship freely regardless of the size or status of each religion. Coming up, a smart, easy way to work remotely. When reading The Great Hope, this section really caught my attention. As arrows from the Lord's quiver, the Reformer's words pierce their hearts. With whom, think you, are ye contending? With an old man from the brink of the grave? No, with truth, truth which is stronger than you, and truth that will overcome you. This brings me great hope because it's an excellent example of how John Wycliffe stood for the truth and he defended that truth to the grave. Even as a person who was very educated in the philosophies of the world, he stood by the truth, the truth of the Bible. 
And this definitely gives me great hope because no matter what happens in our Christian walk, we know that we can stand by the truth of the Bible. Welcome back. Are you constantly emailing yourself files from work to finish at home? Here's John Beckett with a more efficient way to work remotely. Have you ever been frustrated when sending or receiving email attachments? Have you ever wondered whether the document on your laptop or desktop is the newest version? Today we're going to talk about a service that helps with these challenges. The service is called Dropbox. The core concept of Dropbox is very simple. You sign up for an account and install the software on each of your computers. A new folder is created that is in every way normal except that the Dropbox software works behind the scenes to keep documents in the folder synchronized between the computers and the Dropbox site. This means you can start working on a document using your laptop and pick up where you left off on your home PC. It feels like the same document exists on both computers. Since it is a normal folder, you can work on documents whether or not your computer is connected to the internet. The next time you connect, Dropbox syncs things up. Dropbox can also be very helpful to those of us who have only one computer. Remember, the documents stored in the Dropbox folder on your computer are also synced to the Dropbox service on the internet. This means that if you were to lose your computer, everything in the Dropbox folder could be recovered just by installing Dropbox on the new computer. The website also keeps track of changes and deletions of documents. If you make a mistake, you can log into the site to restore what was lost. Finally, Dropbox makes sharing links to things easy. Just right-click the file you want to share and select Get Public Link from the Dropbox section. To learn more, visit dropbox.com. For almost a decade, the Adventist Review has published a companion magazine just for kids. Kids View is geared for children ages 8 to 12 and features stories, devotionals, and puzzles. Walona Karamabadi previews this week's edition. In our December edition of Kids View, it is all about Christmas. We've got a great story from a guy in Australia about holiday traditions in other parts of the world. We've also got a great mission story involving local kids helping others in Haiti. And just so there are no cries of boredom during the break, there are two fun and easy activities to do as well. Many experts still debate whether an occasional glass of red wine might be healthy. Dr. Peter Landless says new concerns about alcohol should change the discussion. The debate rages on, is alcohol good for your health? Well, the debate may rage on, but the evidence is so strong. Alcohol is the third leading cause of preventable death. It is the leading cause of preventable mental retardation in the world, and now, there is more and more scientific evidence which is coming out showing that alcohol is a cancer-causing agent. There are studies which are showing very, very strongly that using alcohol at any dosage, this is not talking about moderate drinking or severe drinking, it's talking about any level of alcohol use is directly causally related to cancers. And the specific cancers which are under the spotlight right now of breast cancer. That has been shown for a number of years already. But now recently in May, the World Cancer Research Fund, an organization which does a huge amount of research on large numbers of people, showed that taking alcohol is directly causally related to causing colon cancer. And no matter what level one takes, there is no level of alcohol that is considered safe when it comes to cancer causing in the human body. And so it is being discussed with the talk about non-communicable diseases that cancer caused by alcohol is one of the most widespread problems faced in health today. Avoid it for your health's sake. Coming up, the news you reported this week. Welcome back. Here's Sergio Gonzalez with this week's iShare Report. Welcome to iShare, where you bring the news to us. This week, iShare reporter Michalista Riibako sends us the story of her family in the Solomon Islands, who recently joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Michalista tells us about her relative James, who recently joined the Seventh-day Adventist Vocational School in the country. 
while going to school, he decided to become a Christian. He told his family about his new faith, and today, most of his village belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. James's father, Deo Kalema, a former traditional priest, was baptized just last year. Makalista asked for her fellow church members to please remember the village of Arakoko in their prayers. Our other iShare story this week comes to us from Tottenham, England, where church members brought some Adventist flavor to a community food festival. In addition to food stalls featuring vegetarian and vegan cuisine, the volunteers took blood pressure and BMI measurements. The church members also gave away free literature and sold winter clothes for the underprivileged at affordable prices. iShare reporter Angela Hunter said many of the 20,000 community members who attended the fair were very impressed with the church's contributions. In fact, area parliament member David Lammy told local pastor David Burnett he hopes to visit the Tottenham Church in the future. The event took place after riots rocked the Tottenham community and led to 200 million pounds of property damage earlier this year. Thanks for watching, and remember to submit your own story to iShare. Just visit newsavenistorg slash iShare. Now let's hear from Adventist historian David Trim. This week, a key milestone in church pioneer Ellen G. White's childhood. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On November 19, 1952, Hattie Andre, beloved Adventist educator, died. In early 1893, Miss Andre sailed on the second voyage of the Pitcairn and worked as a school teacher on Pitcairn Island until June 1896 when she returned to the USA. She taught at Oakwood College for two years. Then, in 1899, Ellen White asked her to join the staff of the new Australasian Missionary College in Australia. She taught there from February 1900 until late 1908, returning to the United States again in 1909, where she became Dean of Women at Pacific Union College, a post she held until June 1920. And she then served as Bible teacher in the Hinsdale School of Nursing and Hinsdale Academy until she retired in 1929. On November 23 in 1969, Benghazi Adventist Hospital, Libya, was nationalized by the new revolutionary regime of Muammar al-Qaddafi. It was the only outpost of Adventism in Libya, and with the expulsion of its mostly foreign staff, no Adventists were left in the country. On November 25 in 1884, Ellen White wrote in the Review and Herald about how, in October 1836, she had been injured by a stone thrown by a childhood classmate. She described the incident and observed, the cruel blow which blighted the joys of earth was the means of turning my eyes to heaven. I might never have known Jesus had the sorrow that clouded my early years not led me to seek comfort in him. And that was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for joining us for Adventist News Network. Tune in next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Mark Kellner. And I'm Fernita Buddy. And as always, visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next week, God bless.